Taking my sin, my cross, my shame As they move in my breath, your name You are my all in all oh, When I fall down, you pick me up When I am down, you fill my cup You are my all in all Ushers will come forward for our offering. <coughs> Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession in the praise of his glory. Father, we just thank you that you did seal us, that we have eternal life with you by putting our faith in Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and shed blood. Thank you so much, Lord. Father, we just ask you to bless this offering. Use it for your honor and glory. Multiply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
Please stand for our final song. Age four to second grade, you're dismissed. Everyone else, stay behind and read all those people around you. You got a good handshake. Okay, Lonnie. God bless you. Thanks for keeping me on track. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me on track yeah. or on task, whatever they say. Yeah, Mark. Well, they always refer you once in a while as John Mark. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a new one. <laughs> uh, are you going to start coming back to uh, Outreach, or are you still... Yeah, I was here last week. Were you? Yeah, just came in a little bit later. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Cool. Hey. <laughs> 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 Am I going to see you at Happy Garden? Am I going to see you at Happy Garden? <laughs> For lunch? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no bad. <laughs>
Ah. Okay, can we please have a seat? Please. No. <laughs> Pretty please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, amen. We have a blessing today uh, from, uh, it's Appleton Alliance, you come from? Yeah, we have the Reverend Mark Tigmeyer is going to bring us his feasting on God. Oh, that's going to be a blessing. So I was here the first service, and it truly was. All right, if you look at our bulletins on Wednesday at 9 a.m., Romans, over at Old Grace House, that's chapter 5 in Romans. And, of course, on 6 p.m., we have one as a youth group. Thursday is 9 a.m., ladies' Bible study. Saturday, 7 a.m., men's prayer. Upcoming events, it says... Uh, 115, Pastor Adam Celine, our pastor, is going to preach. Yay, Pastor! <laughs> Amen. Then on the 17th uh, is the elder meetings. And, Bob, did you tell me, uh, is it wrong here? It's right on the calendar? It's right now? Okay, all right. Cause it, all right. So the 17th is um, elders meeting. The 21st is men's prayer breakfast. And then the 26th is governing board meeting. And 27th is youth group lock-in. Is that going to be here at the church, Josh? The lock-in? Okay. All right, if you open your bulletins. Uh, Secret Sisters, if you're affiliated with that. Uh, there's a potluck going on, so I'll read your, for your details there. Uh, VBS leader, helper meeting post, postponed, it says. So look forward to other meetings scheduled. So family fellowship activities. Uh, if you're interested in leading one or helping out, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, thank you, Ray. Table decorations. Already signed up for November again, so I got November. So if you're interested in signing up, please sign up. And that's just decorating this little table right here. Just that little table. That's, that's all you have to do. If I can do it, anybody can do it. All right? All right. Uh, right. <laughs> oh, if you need help shoveling snow, not gravel, shoveling snow, contact <laughs> Corey Perkins. And... Christmas card table. I see there's still cards out there, so please look and see if you have cards that you could pick up. Daily bread devotionals, if you haven't already picked them up, there's uh, some back there yet. And that's all I have. And so, Mark Tinkmeyer, bring us what the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be with you this morning. I'm the Associate Pastor of Pastoral Care at Alliance Church in Appleton. And uh, just a real brief uh, background. Uh, I've been married to my lovely wife, Mary Beth, for 41 years. We have five grown children, four married, and nine grandchildren. And we had all the kids home for Christmas. And so the noise meter in our house went way up. But we, <laughs> we certainly enjoyed having them. It was great. Uh, so we've just turned the corner into a new year, and uh, as you start out the new year, often our thoughts turn toward making New Year's resolutions. Uh, some of you uh, find this exciting. It's a great time to start over, maybe develop some new disciplines, like uh, maybe work on your devotional life or uh, pick up the physical exercise, uh, work on better money, money management or getting more sleep or perhaps in improving your diet in some way. Brothers, uh, resolutions uh, never seem to work out. And so if someone asks you, what's a New Year's resolution? You might say, well, it's something that goes in one year and out the other. <laughs> or else uh, 
Some of you might say that uh, your New Year's resolution is to stop hanging out with people who ask you about New Year's resolutions. <laughs> so maybe I better stop talking about that. Well, the truth is that <clears throat> when it comes to self-discipline, we all have uh, our own personal views of what that entails. Um, some of us really appreciate discipline, and some of us don't. But as Christians, we're all called to be transformed into the image of Christ, and that involves spiritual disciplines. Some of the disciplines are disciplines of abstinence, such as solitude, silence, sacrifice, and frugality. Others are disciplines of engagement, such as study, worship, uh, service, prayer, and fellowship. Now, I'd like you to look at a slide this morning. As you look at that slide, what comes to mind? Like most of us, we probably have a sense of appetite when we look at food. Some of you might have skipped breakfast this morning. You can't wait to grab some food. But for others, it might bring up a warm feeling of fellowship, uh, maybe time with family or friends or some type of special occasion like the holidays we just celebrated. Food can be a catalyst for many different feelings. Food is one of the most delightful gifts that God has given us. There's certainly nothing simple about food. In fact, God, I think, wants us to enjoy the benefits and enjoyment of food. In fact, Paul argued that we should not follow false teachers who legalistically set up standards for what we should or should not eat. 1 Timothy 4, he says, These teachers forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. So did you ever stop to think about how many passages in Scripture relate to food? Food is a part of festivals, sacrifices, feasts, ceremonies, celebrations, bribery, deception, temptation, gifts, object lessons, and of course word pictures. Think about the symbolism of love and milk and honey, bitter herbs, salt, fruit, and various kinds of meat. In fact, the Bible begins with the story of food where Adam and Eve gave into the temptation to eat the forbidden fruit, which caused the downfall of the entire human race. Then fast forward to Revelation, which is the final book of the Bible, and there we find the image of a banquet table laden with food and drink at the wedding feast of the, of the Lamb. So certainly God wants us to appreciate the gift of food, which is often joined with wonderful times of celebration and fellowship. But if food is such a blessing, then why does the Bible reference fasting over 70 times? This morning, I'd like to talk to you about a subject that is not often discussed in Christian circles, but I think it has profound importance for us as Christians. I'd like to address the subject of fasting. But before we do that, let's just take a moment and pray, shall we? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for food. What a gift, Lord. You've given us taste buds so we might enjoy many different flavors of food. But you've also called us, Lord, to fast, and there's something very special about that discipline. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us about that, that you would enlarge our understanding and help us, Lord, to follow your word and in in, in your command in that way. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if I ask you what's your experience with fasting, I'd probably get a lot of different responses. Some of you might say, well, I really don't know much about fasting. I'm kind of clueless when it comes to that subject. Others would say, well, I thought fasting was some type of an ancient practice that is no longer relevant today unless you're some kind of a religious or health fanatic. Some would say fasting is like dying, right? You're just trying to force yourself not to, not to eat. Or, you know, I'm not really interested in fasting. Frankly, the uh, thought of going hungry makes me uncomfortable. Maybe some of you tried it a couple times and it didn't go well. But then there might be others of you that actually have incorporated spiritual fasting in your daily walk and you've learned the, uh, the benefit of fasting. So whatever your experience is with fasting, I'd like to expand your awareness just a little bit this morning. So let's start with a definition of fasting. What is fasting? Well, fasting is the voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. And now before you tune me out thinking that I'm going to lay a guilt trip on you this morning, let me, let me say a couple of things. First of all, 
I'm not trying to convince you to start a new legalistic practice just to make your life miserable. Uh, actually, I want to introduce you to a godly discipline that when it's uh, combined with prayer can be a powerful tool toward transformation and growth. Years ago, God graciously taught me about fasting, and I can tell you without a doubt that it, it has been one of the greatest blessings of my life. So I'm really excited to share this uh, practice with you this morning. The second caveat is, though, that I know that there are some of you that for either medical or personal reasons can't go without food, and so I understand that, and obviously I'm not trying to encourage anyone to do anything unhealthy. Um, as we'll touch on later, fasting should always be done under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Our goal should be one of obedience to God, and in that way to glorify our Father in all that we do, whether we eat or whether we don't eat. So in the short time we have this morning, I'd like to address two matters related to fasting. First of all, the purpose for fasting. Why did God call us to fast? And then secondly, the pitfalls to avoid when fasting. So let me start with a simple question. Is fasting commanded for Christians? Well, the answer to that would be no. Um, in the New Testament, we don't see a specific command for believers to fast. Fasting is a choice that we make with the leading of the Holy Spirit. However, with that said, we must be very careful to examine our heart motive when we're making a decision to not fast. As you pray and study scripture for yourself, I think you'll come to the conclusion that fasting actually has a very significant place for Christian life. Let's look at two uh, important New Testament scriptures that give a basis for fasting. The first one is found in Matthew 6, where Jesus is teaching on the subject of giving, praying, and fasting. I won't take time to read the entire passage, but I just want you to highlight, but I just want to highlight the beginning of each section. Jesus begins each subject in the same way. He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Notice that he doesn't say if, but he says when. In this passage, Jesus seems to be elevating fasting to the same level of importance as giving and praying. And I'm sure you would agree that prayer and giving are vital disciplines for Christians, and, and so it would seem that fasting would be a regular, should be a regular part of our Christian life. In Matthew 9, some of John's disciples questioned Jesus on why the disciples didn't fast. Jesus answered, Well, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. I agree with those who interpret this passage to mean that we're now at a time when we're waiting for the bridegroom, who is Jesus Christ, to return in all of his glory. And while we wait, we pray and fast. So now let's look at a couple of purposes for fasting. You've probably heard of intermittent fasting which has become pretty popular. If you go to the app store on your phone, you probably see a number of apps that are related to this subject, most of which um, are focused on either losing weight or gaining health by developing some type of regimen of meal timing schedules that cycle between voluntary fasting and non-fasting. But that isn't the kind of fasting that we're talking about today. The fasting we're concerned with is spiritual fasting. Spiritual fasting is different than uh, intermittent fasting because it has its focus on something outside of ourselves, outside of our own personal interests. So the first and most important reason for fasting is to bring glory to God. If fasting is not done for the purpose of focusing on God, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. Too often we measure the value of something by asking the question, what's in it for me? But that's really the wrong question. The right question is, in doing this, how can I bring praise and honor to God? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So how does fasting glorify God? Well, fasting refocuses our gaze from our own natural passions and desires to God's interests. Things such as worship, evangelism, discipleship, and service. Fasting helps us to gain a kind of heart like the psalmist had when he said, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
Then consider David's words in Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Do you resonate with that? I mean, can you really say that you hunger and thirst for God more than anything else? If you're like me, it's hard to say that our thoughts and our passions are fully focused on God. When was the last time that you talked about longing for Jesus' return? If you're healthy and not going through any crisis right now, then I would guess you probably don't regularly focus on the second coming. But in truth, we should constantly be eternally focused. Paul reminds us that in 2 Timothy 4, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Noticing that, notice that longing for Christ's return is just a natural hallmark for believers. How did uh, Paul stay so spiritually fit? Well, I think part of the answer is that he regularly practiced spiritual disciplines, including fasting. When citing the many ways that he suffered and for Christ in 2 Corinthians 11, he specifically noted fasting. <coughs> he said, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without food or sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. So I think from Scripture, it's pretty clear that Paul regularly fasted. (coughs) Did Paul fast because he wanted to boast about being some type of super Christian? No, I don't think so. I don't think Paul's motive was impure. Paul took God's word seriously. In Matthew 4, Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Fasting helps us redirect our thoughts to God. Instead of eating a meal when we're fasting, we might take the 20 minutes or hour or whatever time you use to to eat and just focus on prayer and, and perhaps reading scripture. We intentionally set aside time when we're fasting to focus on God and his greatness and his provision and purposes for our life. The second purpose for fasting is to humble ourselves before God. Let's face it, our flesh is pretty rebellious and stubborn, but God honors a humble and broken spirit. Isaiah writes, "These These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Some time ago, I was visiting my dad who lives in Des Moines, Iowa, and I went out for an early morning run. There's a trail that's just north of his house that I enjoy jogging on, and This particular morning, I came up on a section of the trail where there was a sign blocking the trail that said, trail closed. And I thought to myself, thank you. Um, Well, I'm sure I can find a way around the construction. And so I started to take off, and then it suddenly struck me, Mark, you are such a rebel. You're such a rule breaker. (laughs) It's so easy to be a rebel, isn't it? Uh, And as I dwelled on that thought, I thought about other ways that I also sometimes rebel. How about speed limits? Are speed limit signs merely suggestions or are they really laws? Do we really have to stay 55 on the county highways? As humans, you know, we're just prone to break laws. We, uh, we're prone to sin, frankly. You know, fasting is a way to help break the rebellion in us. The Bible says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Our natural tendency is to give in to our appetites, not just food, but any of our natural appetites, pleasure, comfort, entertainment, sexual gratification, ownership, and selfish ambitions. With regard to food in this culture, you know, we're accustomed to eat three meals a day, and we often have snacks between the meals. Sometimes if we have to skip a meal, we say we're starving. (laughs) I once heard a priest talking about a ministry 
uh, that provides food for the hungry in Haiti. He shared that a group of people there live between the city and the dump. Every day they go into the dump with the trash that's piled like five feet deep. And the problem is, though, that the trash is set on fire and many of the people are barefoot. So when they go into the trash to dig for food, they often burn the bottoms of their feet. Well, this priest came upon two brothers one day. The younger brother had a cup, half a cup of rice that he had dug out of the dump. And when the priest asked the older brother, how come only the younger brother was eating? The boy replied, it's not my turn to eat today. Boy, that's convicting. And I have to be honest with you, if you really get serious with God about fasting, you may hear him say to you, it's not your turn to eat today. But that's not because God wants us to be miserable or even hungry for that matter. Actually, it's because, because God wants us to share deeply in his love for the world and to identify more fully with the physical and spiritual needs of those who are without. I find that in my own life when I fast, it helps me to be more in tune with the sufferings of the world and less inclined to have a selfish kind of attitude of entitlement. When we, when we fast, we actually say no to the flesh. Basically, we're telling our bodies, you can't be in control today. If you've never fasted for any significant t- length of time, you'll be amazed at how strong the flesh can be. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, says, more than any other discipline, fasting reveals the things that control us. I guarantee you that your body won't surrender easily. And even after you've uh, overcome your fleshly desire to eat through fasting, it'll come roaring right back in a very short matter of time. Let me add a footnote here. Most of you at one time or another have skipped a meal, right? And so often we talk ourselves through the discomfort by looking forward to the next meal. We'll tell ourselves, oh, we had to skip lunch, but we'll make up for it this dinner, this evening, the dinner. If you can, try to fast for an entire day. In that way, you won't give your flesh an opportunity to quickly gratif- be quickly gratified with the thought that you'll be eating in just a short time. I'm not suggesting that fasting is all about the flesh fighting the flesh. In fact, even the Apostle Paul acknowledged the personal battle with his sinful um, nature. Actually, fasting merely reveals how deeply we need God. Here's the good news. We don't have to be slaves to our flesh. Paul writes in Galatians 5, 24 and 25, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Fasting helps us to set our mind on the things above, not on the earthly things, and put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to our earthly nature. Once I sensed that I was supposed to fast for an extended period of time, and I I thought it was because I was preparing for a message, but um, as I was fasting, I met with I met with a young woman who came in and shared some of her life struggles with me. And long story short, I was privileged to lead this young woman to Christ. I felt some emotion welling up in me within, inside of me when I realized that God had actually called me to fast in preparation for this divine appointment. And you know, as I look back, it's interesting how many days that I have been fasting where I've had the privilege to lead somebody to Christ. I don't think that's a coincidence. Well, the third purpose for fasting is to intensify prayer. We could turn to many scriptural examples of fasting coupled with prayer. Certainly our Lord fasted. Prior to starting his earthly ministry, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Now, before you write off 40 days as a supernatural fast, let me tell you that there are many people that have actually done a 40-day fast. In fact, I met a pastor in Chicago that's done that. I read once that there have been over 200,000 believers in South Korea that have completed a 40-day fast. Now, I don't tell you that to wow you, but perhaps to stretch your vision of God's supernatural calling in your life, Think about some of the other biblical characters who have fasted. For example, King Jehoshaphat, who proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. 
we're talking about men, women, and children when their nation was being invaded by several opposing armies. The result was that God fought for them and the entire enemy army destroyed themselves. The Israelite army didn't even have to raise a, a sword. You can read more about that in Second Chronicles 20 if you're interested. Then there's the story of Queen Esther, Esther, who asked for all of the Jewish people to fast from both food and drink. That's pretty intense. For three days, with the result that God gave Esther favor with King Xerxes and the Jews were spared from a mass extermination. To this, we could also add the list of Moses, Daniel, David, Hezekiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, and many other Old Testament names. In the New Testament, we find men like Paul and Barnabas and a number of church leaders who prayed and fasted before appointing elders and seeking God's guidance in several manners or several matters. If you look back in U.S. history, you'll find that fasting has been very much a part of our national heritage. President John Adams, James Madison, and Abraham Lincoln all called for national fasts. I wonder sometimes what would happen today if our Congress would proclaim a national day of prayer and fasting? What if millions of Christians, men, women, and children, collectively fasted and repented? I think God would honor that, and I think our nation would actually see some healing, don't you? If you have an urgent need today, I would uh, encourage you to consider seeking the Lord through prayer and fasting. Maybe you're fighting some type of spiritual battle or relational problem, or maybe you're struggling with some type of physical or emotional pain, or you have a practical need for a job, or maybe you need to make a major decision. Fasting has been a part of many spiritual blessings in my life, including salvation of friends and relatives, physical healing, divine protection, opportunities to witness, guidance, financial support, and provision, insight, and relationship healing. I'd like to share a testimony with you of uh, one way that God used fasting in the lives of one family that I met with years ago. I have their permission to share this story, and, but I'll still keep their names confidential. Um, two sisters came in to see me and um, said that one of them would like to be a surrogate mother for the other who was having trouble getting pregnant. I think they had been trying for about three and a half years unsuccessfully. And they wanted to know what I thought about this from a spiritual perspective. And as we discussed it, I, I just felt like there were a number of potential risks to their family relationship. So I asked if the sisters and their husbands would agree to fast and pray about this decision. They agreed, and so we all prayed and fasted. Then I met with, again with the sisters and their husbands, and we talked about the decision, and I found out that they were not all in agreement. So I told them we needed to wait until we had clarity of the direction we should go. And that was pretty hard for them, especially the sisters who were in tears, but they agreed that they would wait. Well, you know, several months later, I got a card from the sister who had struggled to get pregnant. She wrote to me and she said she had some exciting news. She said she was pregnant. In fact, she said she didn't know it then, but she was pregnant when we last met. And after that, they were also blessed with even another child. So God is so good. And I have seen so many ways that God has used prayer and fasting over the years. Well, before we close, let me uh, just throw out a couple of pitfalls to avoid when fasting. First of all, number one, don't fast for show. In Matthew 6, 16 and 17, Jesus warns against fasting for the purpose of seeking the praise of others. Jesus said, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. When you fast, just go about your day as normal. You don't have to make a big deal of it. and You don't have to uh, be uncomfortable either. I've sat through many meals where all I've had was a glass of water. And you know, nobody really cares, especially if they get to eat your dessert. <laughs> I remember when I was in college and I was just learning about the uh, practice of fasting and I was a volunteer staff member of Campus Life Youth for Christ. And at that time we were meeting in homes with the high school students. And on this particular night, 
I was fasting. Uh, the hostess had made a plate of cookies, and so she was coming down the line handing out these cookies, and I was sitting on the couch, and as she came down the line, I thought, oh, boy, what am I going to say? You know, I don't want to offend her. And as she got to me, somebody called her name, and she turned her head, and she passed right over me, never even noticed. <laughs> it was really quite remarkable. So the Lord will take care of you when you're fasting. You can be sure of that. Uh, number two, don't make fasting a ritual. Isaiah warned that fasting can be a form of hypocrisy if it is void of genuine good deeds, such as caring for the poor and being kind to others. The Lord rebuked his people through the prophet in this way. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I'll tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. John Piper cautioned, don't make fasting a religion of discipline. If you do that, you may be simply exchanging one sin for another. You may be exchanging unhealthy passions for unhealthy pride and self-will. Now, I'll be honest with you, there have been days over the years where I have fasted purely in the flesh, and I don't think there's a whole lot of spiritual value to that. Now, spiritual fasting is not meant to be a hunger strike or a diet or even a glorified body washing cleansing. Although there are certainly health benefits, that's not the primary purpose that God calls us to fast. Fasting isn't about self-will or asceticism for its own sake. That simply could lead to some obsession with self-denial. The goal must also be beyond ourselves, looking to the godliness, looking to godliness and a deeper relationship with the Lord. And finally, fasting is not about earning merit with God. At this very moment, you know, God loves us as much as he ever will. We're never going to change that. Nothing you ever do will change his love for you. Fasting isn't about changing God, it's about changing us. Let me say in closing that as Christians, we don't have to fast, we get to fast. Fasting is not repressive, it's actually liberating. As one person has said, fasting is really feasting on God. I can't tell you how many times that I have recommended to clients or others that have come into my office to pray and fast about some matter. And then I have heard some amazing stories that come back and told me how God answered. Now, if you're hungry to get to know God, I would encourage you to fast. It's biblical. If you're uncertain about it, ask God to show you. Ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you. Now, I'll remind you of Jesus' promise in John 6. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In closing, let me, uh, let me challenge you in this new year to take at least one challenge and try a spiritual fast. If you've never done it, try at least a meal or perhaps an, a whole day and just see if God doesn't bless that for you. I think you will be amazed at I as I have how much God honors the practice of fasting. So I would just encourage you to do that. And uh, I hope that you'll experience more intimacy with God as a result of that. So let me close this in prayer. Our Father, thank you for giving us the practice of fasting. Lord, um, it's been such a blessing in my life, Lord. And I thank you for all the times you've shown me supernatural ways that you have moved. And um, Father, I don't know what it is about fasting that moves your hand, but I thank you for what you do in us when we fast and what you do through us, Lord. And so I just ask that um, the brothers and sisters here would take it serious, Lord, and really think about it, pray about it, ask you whether this should become a part of their spiritual life. 
I thank you, Lord, that you will guide us by your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.